you would please turn with me in your Bibles once again to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Before I read the passage, I want to say to those of you who are watching online, whether it's live or whether you're watching this recorded some time from now, that uh, if you're feeling more comfortable about coming, we welcome you to come. There's plenty of room, and it would be nice to meet you and see you if you've never been here before. Uh, we're a little messy at the moment because we have ongoing repairs but we expect those to be finished fairly soon. So when the time comes that you feel, com that you feel comfortable and the Lord is leading you, uh, please don't, don't, be, don't be afraid to come and hopefully you'll feel very welcome. Gospel of Luke chapter 19. I'm going to be reading the first 27 verses. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has gained five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you. Because you are an austere man, you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him. And give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. I don't think it's an easy thing for us to separate Christianity or our experience or understanding of Christianity from our culture. I think that's a very difficult thing. I think we are always viewing the Bible and Christianity through the way we were raised, the way we were taught, how we think, uh, and through a lens of how we absorb and process reality. Uh, 
American culture, which we're all a part of to at least some degree, if not totally part of it, uh, by virtue of its very history, by virtue of its very formation, by virtue of its very identity and success even, is individualistic and is capitalistic. Now, those things are not evil in and of themselves, but it becomes a bad thing when we use those things to view our Christianity rather than to, view our, to take our Christianity and view those things. I, I find it interesting and fascinating that our innate practice is often to take our experiences and to take our, our common understanding of life and then impose them on Christianity uh, rather than take biblical narrative, biblical culture, biblical understanding, biblical direction, the word of truth, and change our culture. Uh, take the concept seen in this passage, the idea of seeking Jesus. We tend take that concept of somebody seeking Jesus and put it into terms that uh, we, th the way we function as a culture, which is often uh, uh, commerce, commercialization. Uh, we've got this idea that if someone is seeking truth or if someone is seeking Christ, then it's our responsibility to sell Christ as a product, uh, to show him that, to show this person that this is the best product for them to purchase, uh, to show this person that they're making the right decision in seeking Jesus. And so we'll make the church palatable, uh, we'll make the church enjoyable, or we'll change things to try and make sure the customer is satisfied because the customer is always right. And we've got to make sure that we have pleasant customers or happy customers. I hope we all recognize that when we hear it in those terms, uh, we say and we uh, think that that is very wrong. And that the Bible nowhere presents evangelism or the seeking of Jesus in any way like that. When Christ says he comes to seek and to save the lost, we have to remember that it's not just selling a product. He's coming to save lost souls. And he is the one who's doing the seeking first. So instead of thinking it in terms of we have to sell ourselves, we have to create branding and have a church that has a brand that appeals to a demographic, instead of thinking it in those terms, we have to remember that the Bible, the gospel, the kingdom of God is kind of like oxygen to an astronaut, all right? They need it. And if that supply is dwindling or is cut off, they struggle and strangle and die. The gospel is not a product that needs to be sold. The gospel is an absolute essential. It's... it's Oxygen to an astronaut, water to somebody crawling in the Sahara Desert or in Death Valley. If you don't have it, you've got no hope. And nobody has to make water sound palatable to you. Nobody has to sell oxygen to the astronaut. They recognize that they need it because this is an objective need, not a, not a need based on where I am, who I am, how I'm feeling, what my culture is, and or where my needs are at the moment. He's an objective need, an objective Savior. He's not a personalized T-shirt Savior. Uh, the rich young ruler was coming to Christ looking for a sales pitch. What must I do to gain eternal life? And he went away sorrowful because Jesus' sales pitch was not appealing. He didn't buy into that sales pitch. Zacchaeus is a fascinating study in contrast from the rich man in the previous chapter. Uh, Zacchaeus is corrupt. It says that he was a chief tax collector. I think we all have enough of an understanding of, of uh, Palestine at this time that we've heard it said before that the tax collectors were in it for themselves. Sure, they collected tax for the Romans. That put them uh, on everybody's bad side to begin with because everybody hated the Romans. But the tax collectors got rich by embezzling the taxes, by asking for more that was, than what was needed, by essentially acting like, uh, like mafia. Everybody hated tax collectors. And we know that Zacchaeus was corrupt not only because he was a chief tax collector, but because he was rich. Well, if you were just following the rules, you wouldn't be that rich. You had to be in it for yourself. 
So we know he's a corrupt man. He's a rich man contrasting with uh, the, the rich young ruler because we just heard also Jesus say that it's impossible for a rich person to enter into heaven except by the power of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And just as God has to break and bend the laws of science and the laws of believability for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, so he has to break and bend the laws of natural ability for someone to be saved, especially someone whose God is their riches. So Zacchaeus stands out as a, as a great contrast to the man we met last week. He will even, he, he, is, he is seeking Christ, and it says he is seeking Christ, but we have the understanding based on Jesus' previous teaching, it has to be by the power of God, that he is already being drawn. He is even willing to do something that is embarrassing to find out more and to genuinely seek. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and addresses him as good teacher. Ah, oh, fellow man, what must I do to gain eternal life? Testing him. Zacchaeus climbs up into a tree, doesn't care about his dignity, and wants to see who Jesus is. He's not going to test him. He wants to observe him. He wants to see this objective figure. Who is this guy? And I want to find out. And I will do what it takes, even if that's embarrassing and humiliating, to find out. See, when someone is genuinely seeking Christ, it ought to inform our evangelism, that that person is already being drawn and already being led. If someone is asking us a question about our faith, about the Bible, about the gospel, about Christ, know that there is already something of an advantage on your side because even for them to ask that question, even for them to show an interest, there is some working of God there. Harness that. Zacchaeus didn't just one day, uh, say, out of the blue, I think I'm going to get rich by climbing this tree and viewing Jesus. No, he's being drawn. There's a, con there's a little bit of a conviction there. And when that person is interested in doing something embarrassing or humiliating to find out more, that again is evidence of them truly seeking. And we have this idea that if we invite people to a barbecue, and then never talk about God and make people feel like we're just like everybody else, how is that finding out about Jesus? Or invite someone to a movie night and never mention anything about spirituality, how is that finding about, about Jesus? If they are interested enough to find out about Jesus, Lord willing, the Lord drawing them would enable them to do something that is also kind of awkward and also sometimes kind of humiliating, like come to a worship service where they've never been before to find out, to see who this Christ is. I think that's the equivalent of what Zacchaeus is doing here. The other interesting study about Zacchaeus, which informs evangelism and which informs a contrast with the rich young ruler, is that Zacchaeus sees the objective truth, and then the Lord calls him. Christ says, come. I'm going to stay with you. Immediately, Zacchaeus has a burden of responsibility. He wasn't just seeking to find out, to say, oh, this is interesting. I'll stay off on the sidelines. No, immediately the Lord calls him and says, I've got something for you to do. I'm going to stay with you. You're going to put me up. Okay. I'm okay with that. You can impose upon me, Lord. See, a conviction has been worked in Zacchaeus to bring about some evidence that he doesn't go, oh, no, I can't handle that. I can't put you up. That's too much for me. That's too much of a burden. Oh, I don't know what I'll do here. That's, everybody's going to be looking at me. Everybody's going to be focusing on me. I can't do that. No. He says, how wonderful. Okay, I'll take you. We see him content with Christ and content with God that he's okay to take him on no matter what people think or what people say. So content that it even informs the rest of his life and his actions. He, we see Zacchaeus 
testified that his previous God and the previous things that he has depended on, he no longer loves. He says, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it four times. Sacrifice much? So I recognize that this was my God. And now I no longer love that God. Now I have found the true God, the true way, the true life. And I'm going to give up what I previously loved for this true God. I'll give back to those I stole from and restore it even fourfold. I'll give back to those who are needy rather than gain and amass more riches to myself. I have changed my life because I am satisfied with something greater. And that greatness, that power overwhelms my insecurity and overwhelms what holds me back and what keeps me in the darkness and, and narrow-minded. I am convicted of the fullness of God. And that, brothers and sisters, is a sign of, ge of a genuine seeker who has found, of a genuine convert who has changed. American Christianity has made evangelism something that is so surface-oriented, so casual, if you walk down an aisle and take some literature and say some words, suddenly you're saved and you can go in a number book. We've really fallen into problems in the last 150 years with that idea. I think we have really damaged the church and its reputation by thinking that that is conversion. Even today, when we hear of people boasting of hundreds of converts after a service, where is the conviction? Where is the lasting sacrifice, the lasting change? The lasting conviction. What is the attitude that Zacchaeus could ask himself, that we would ask ourselves, that a genuine convert would ask himself, what does God hate about my life? What does God hate about what I do and what I am and then what I am in habit of that I must cut off and pluck out? See, there's no commercialism in this conviction. There's no commercialism. What you see is lordship and devotion. You are my king, you are my lord, you are my God. I bow the knee before you. You are my sovereign lord, and I am yours. I will do what it takes to seek to serve you and follow you. And the Lord Jesus declares, today salvation has come to this house. <laughs> but the people don't like that. They don't like that because Zacchaeus bothered them. What? Now this guy gets off scot-free. Now this guy is going to be accepted by this, this one who says he's the son of God, just like that? Absolutely just like that. Why? Why has salvation come to this house? Because he is a, is a son of Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith, and so is Zacchaeus. We're told that Abraham was justified by faith, and then it was demonstrated in his works. Well, Zacchaeus is justified by faith, and that faith is then demonstrated in his works. The externals of the past are what the world and what the skeptics want to judge you by. Christ does not. When he says salvation has come to this house, he'll say the same for anyone who professes faith, and then their life testifies of that faith. Salvation has come to this house because you are also a child of Abraham. Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's child and heirs according to the promise. And that's what's going on here. Judgmentalism is rife in Christianity also because our culture uh, informs it. Consumerism teaches you've got to earn your way out of your trouble. Pay off your debts. Christ wipes them clean. Consumerism and commerciality says, make yourself a better product. Make yourself a better salesman. Christ says, no, I substitute myself in your place. You are covered by my white robe. You are covered by my blood. Don't worry about your image, your reputation. I've covered that. You're a son of Abraham, justified by faith, now seen in your action, and marked, marked with the seal of baptism. 
covered by the blood, redeemed. Very, Zacchaeus very different from the rich young ruler. Zacchaeus genuine, rich young ruler, just a casual shopper. What a wonderful testimony. What a wonderful example. What a wonderful teaching. Now, as this is going on, and as the Lord Jesus is teaching, and as this is being demonstrated, it says, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Why? Because they're getting close to Jerusalem. And some of our American traits that we know are also universal. And one of those universal traits that's found in this century and in the text here is an impatience. As they get close to Jerusalem... Some following Jesus are saying, oh, yes, now. Now he will immediately bring in the kingdom. You know, the next passage is the triumphal entry, and we've discussed the immediacy of the kingdom when, we, when I preached on that and when we think on that. But here's the precursor to it. Now he will immediately bring in the kingdom. And now he will immediately do something political. Now he will immediately do something military. Great. Now is the moment we're looking for. But that's not a life after Christ. And that's not part of this uncommercialized gospel that he brings and that he preaches. So he tells a parable to put the emphasis on a life of faithfulness in him and a life of activity of faithfulness in him rather than the political kingdom, the immediacy of it, the military kingdom that they all seek. Remember, this, this parable has often been abused and sometimes made to make us afraid that uh, we're not doing the right thing or uh, that we are uh, uh, not being profitable enough for our God. Please understand this parable in the context. This parable is preached in the context of those who are not living faithfully because they think that everything will be over soon and they want their political and military savior. I find it interesting that over and over again, the themes that come up in our passages on Sunday often parallel with things that we have spoken of in our Thursday night Bible study. So for those who come and tune into that, forgive me, I'm going to repeat a couple things. But uh, this week, just a couple days ago, I I found a fascinating interview with a big O Orthodox priest who was raised a Presbyterian and went to the same seminaries I went to, different campuses, uh, but Westminster in California and Reformed Theological Seminary. He was extremely knowledgeable, and he made uh, probably the best defense of orthodoxy, big O orthodoxy, that I ever heard of. And he made some critiques of Reformed Protestantism that I have heard before, that I'm not convinced of, but nonetheless uh, are legitimate critiques sometimes. And one of the things that he has said that we discussed in Bible study, that he says that evangelicals, in the broadest sense, uh, don't understand sanctification. To narrow that down a little, he would even have said they don't understand Christian living and sanctification. In other words, going back to what I said earlier, this idea that when you are saved, it's a moment in time, you've walked down the aisle, you've professed your faith, Somebody says, now you're saved, write that date in the front of your Bible. In broad evangelicalism, sometimes that's the end of the road. You're saved. Hallelujah. Now what? And this man was critiquing that aspect of evangelicalism. And that's a good, that's a real and right critique. Far too much of broad evangelicalism is, you're saved, that's the end of the story, hallelujah. And so many broad evangelical churches will preach the same message every week just so more people will make that profession of faith, and that's it. That's the extent of Christianity, is profession of faith, profession of faith, evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. And if you want to move on in your faith, and if you want to grow in your faith, the only options for you are missions and evangelism. That's it. I'm speaking in generalities, and so is he. But what if you're not gifted in evangelism? What if you're not gifted in missions? What if that's not your calling? Then what? You're left to stagnate. 
I believe that this parable here, where he gives his servants a value of, of, of money, which is honestly meant to teach about gifts. He gives his, his servants gifting. He gives his servants something that is valuable. And then he says, do business till I come. I like the way the King James puts it, occupy till I come. He gives them this, and he's essentially saying, live and serve in faithfulness till I come back. For some, that will be evangelism. For some, that will be missions. But it's more than that. It's broader than that. You yourself are not going to bring in the kingdom of God. He's going to bring in the kingdom when he comes back. Don't live like it's up to you to bring in the kingdom, but live like he is going to return and look to see your faithfulness. Do the business that is given to you and commit it to Christ, whatever that is. If you're an artist, you can live a rich, full life occupying till he comes. If you're a musician, if you're a teacher, if you are an engineer, if you are a construction worker, if you, whatever, everything, all of these things can be sanctified. All of these things can be committed to God, and all of these things can be grown and handed back to Him. The kingdom of God is very broad. The church is very broad and very rich. There's room for all kinds of talents, all kinds of interests, all kinds of gifting. Do the business that is given to you. Know your gifting and know your calling, and know that it can be normal. And what is normal can be made sacred by the sanctification of God. And by being made sacred, what is normal can be exciting. Don't say, I'm not as good of a Christian because I've never gone on a missions trip. Don't say, I'm not as good of a Christian because I don't pray like that guy over there. Don't say, I'm not as good of a Christian because I haven't been called to ministry. Everyone, everyone in, if, they're, if they're faithful and committed, can be a wonderful Christian. And the parable commends the servants who invested what they were given because the growth wasn't by their efforts, it was by God's leading. Notice that. They acted and stepped out in faith. They didn't go and say, let's mint some counterfeit coins. Let's, let's create more coins so that we can give more coins back to the master. No, they don't do that. They invest what they have in something that they have no control over. They could have lost all that money. But no, they put it in the bank. And banks, you know, there's no FDIC insurance, all right? So I mean this. There's no security in them absolutely gaining interest. They put it somewhere where they had no control and trusted and stepped out in faith that what they were given would grow so that they can give it back to the Lord. And that's what he's commending them on, that they trusted outside themselves. You want growth? Discern your call and try something new. Discern your call, step out in faith, and do it in faith. And trust the Lord to grow it by his leading. Faithful in little, you'll be, be given much in his kingdom. Faithful in a little shows your trust, shows that you're not going to look to master your ten cities or five cities. You're going to look to commit those cities to the Lord, which they belong to anyway. And you're going to do business and occupy till he comes. See, the contrast is the person who is so afraid that he just doesn't do anything. We'll get to that in a minute. But the faithfulness, the faithfulness is the key. And there's a spiritual exercise in growing that faithfulness in everything that we do. The Orthodox priest, unfortunately, instead of offering this solution of faithfulness in everything, uh, his, what he was offering, in contrast to broad evangelicalism, unfortunately, was ritualism. For them, you grow your life in sacramentology and in practices and and uh, church ritualism, veneration of things, perhaps even the monastic life. And while I give him the credit that that is certainly more of an option than now what do I do that I've written that date in the front of my Bible, 
those, are, that's, those options are still not biblical options. And they're still not what the Lord Jesus commends and commands. You, biblical Christian, have the Holy Spirit to guide you and the Word to show you and teach you. Not at dead ritualism, but you can ask the question, how can I exercise my faith and ripen God's fruit? How can I do that? Well, first you look to the Scripture and you see what is God's fruit and what do I work on? So you take your calling, you take your gifting, and you look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And you say, okay, how do I take who I am and what I am and what I'm called and what I'm gifted with and increase something like love in my practical life? Spiritual exercise. Yeah, it comes by reading, comes by worshiping, comes by praying. But in depending more on the Lord, He will increase your love. Something like joy. Same thing. How do you practice and exercise in joy? Not dead ritualism, but the means of grace. Something like peace. How do I find more peace in God and with my surroundings and with what, is, uh, what I'm dealing with? Long-suffering. How, how do I find myself being more long-suffering with God and with people? Kindness. How do I exercise kindness? That's a hard one in this world. How can I be more kind? How can I be, exercise more goodness in what I do, in my profession, in my vocation? More faithfulness, more gentleness, more self-control. These are the spiritual exercises. Your Christian life doesn't just end with your profession of faith at the altar call or that moment you knew you were saved. Your Christian life continues to grow, and all of these things are part of your sanctification from the, until the day you die. There is never a time where you are finished or done until you go home to glory, and every day is a new and exciting day that the Lord is growing you and working on you in these spiritual exercises. To work on these things and to grow in these things means that, by contrast, you avoid toxic influences. That's a popular term right now, toxic. But Christian teaching has always told people to avoid toxic influences. Avoid people who would lead you away from God, who would lead you into evil. Every activity can become toxic. But when it's committed to God and sanctified and done according to His Word and His will, then it's beautiful and it's fulfillment in occupation and in God's business. Of course, we have this last servant we can't ignore. And he represents the alternative to the person who occupies and does business. He represents the alternative to the person who is faithful, who redeems the time because the days are evil. This person is motivated by fear. Now, we know very well that we are right to fear God. The fear of God is a wonderful and awesome thing, but it is wrong when it is a cowering, immoral, selfish fear. When it is a fear of self-preservation alone, then it is not a godly fear. And it is not a fear of God, it is a fear of your own loss. A joyous fear is a fear of God. I know that's hard for our human comprehension, a joyous fear, but that's a godly fear, a joyous fear. A selfish fear is a cowering fear. Remember, you don't have to fear God because you're afraid of losing. God is your preservation. God has given you all things. God is your supply. You don't fear that He's going to take away. You're the reason. He, he, he's the reason you have. But this last servant in the parable is afraid, deadly afraid. And we see that self-centeredness. His life was not for his master. His life was not for his master's kingdom. His life was not devoted to service. His life was not representative of Zacchaeus who was seeking and was saved and was co co uh, convicted. His life is his own. He doesn't step out in faith, and he doesn't live productively. He just sits on his gifting and waits for the Lord to return. Says, I'm not going to do anything because I'm afraid I'll, I'll lose who I am and I'll lose what I have. Uh, I'm afraid to step out. I'm afraid to, to put my trust in something. I'll just wait until he returns. See, there's the context of the parable. Don't, don't think that, that fear and panic over the end times is something that's unique to the 20th century. People are always saying, well, why should I, why should I do anything if God is going to come back soon? Christ always has taught against that. The apostles always taught against that. 
No, you occupy till he comes, and you don't fear his coming. You rejoice in his coming. But those who do not live for God are really only looking for their own freedom and their own way. It's an ugly, self-centered Phariseeism. Um, if I can't rule, if I can't be God, if I can't control what's been given to me, if I don't have mastery over it, then there's no point to living. If I can't control my own destiny, and I can't control my circumstances, then there's no point to living. Let me tell you, 21st century culture, that that is something that gets people full of anxiety and depression. You want control, and when you realize you don't have it, you feel like you're up against a wall. God is the answer to that. Christ is the salvation. Christ is the one who says, I'm in control. Trust me, and I'll take care of you. Don't worry about your anxiety, about your fear. I'll handle that. But this servant doesn't think that way. He misuses the resources. The fear causes the resources to be uh, wasted. Instead of put to use, they're stockpiled. Instead of something that could have benefited the Lord and his kingdom, it could have benefited others. No, he holds it. He builds a bunker, preps and stores enough food, and sits on it for himself. Not for his community, not for his church, not for his Lord, not for his family, for himself. And he says, if I lose this, then I will lose my happiness. And what will I have? His fear is crippling. Very much like the rich young ruler. If I lose this, I'll lose who I am. Well, that's the very point. Lose who you are and take on Christ. Very much unlike Zacchaeus. So what do we learn from this? Well, as he seeks us, we are to seek him. But in commitment and in sacrifice and in truth, in faith. We're justified by faith. We're sanctified by faith. And it's all by God's grace, by God's gifting, by God's moving, by God's working. Seek salvation and life, and you will find it in the one place. If you are truly seeking, you will only be satisfied with what Christ supplies. Your resources will be forfeit. Your goals become forfeit. And your loves become forfeit. And you will be, and that will all be exchanged for a union. Almighty God, the Almighty Triune God. If you're feeling lost, He seeks and He saves and He finds. If you're feeling purposeless, and your job might seem boring, and the promises that your elementary school teachers and your high school teachers and your coaches all held out to you, do your best, reach for the stars, be the best you can be, and now you find yourself in a life that is relatively normal. Don't let that get to you. God will redeem that normal and make it exciting because He will be your purpose. Don't feel like you have to live up to a societal standard. God will sanctify who you are and make it part of His kingdom. And your gifting will be grown because He's doing the work. The Lord will find you and redeem you and save you and give you your sight. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of sound mind. God lifts us up. He encourages. He breathes life into us. One of the sad things and one of the tragedies of this pandemic and of our own suburbia is that we're to feed off of each other in these things. When we exercise the gifts of God, we're to commune with each other in those things. I have this, I'll help you. I have this, I'll help you. We complement one another. And the pandemic has torn us asunder, made us nervous to be around each other because we're afraid of, giving, uh, of getting someone else sick, and that's a legitimate concern. But it's unfortunate that it has done, done it to such a degree. We, we stay home, we don't come, we don't fellowship, we don't want to be together. Suburbia has done that in the first place. We don't know our neighbors. We don't live next to each other. There's no town center. We have to drive half an hour to see everybody. That's a problem. Now, by God's grace and by God's power, he will help us to overcome that. But we've got to step out in faith, and we've got to love him and recognize that the church, his church, his body, 
is where these things are cultivated and where we are given a fullness. We seek his kingdom. His kingdom is here. And then it grows out from here. And we're all part of that. And we rejoice in that. And when we recognize and put our faith in that and are convicted of that, we recognize that his salvation is full. We are declared just by his grace. We are declared righteous by his grace. And we are being made holy and living and exercising by his grace. And then by his grace, we're glorified for eternity in eternity. From lost to found, saved, convicted to growing to glorified. This is our great God. This is his great kingdom. This is his great work. And this is his gifting. May it be multiplied and may it be given back to him. All glory to God, our Savior, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you that you are a Savior. Not a wise man, not a good teacher, not a good salesman, not a professor not a counselor alone, but a savior. You take what is lost, you take what is evil, you take what is corrupt, and you save it. You redeem it and make it yours. You've done that with us. I pray that you continue to do it with our lives. Continue to do it with our church. Continue to do it with our community. Continue to do it with our hearts. Revive us, grow us, convict us. And may we indeed give all that you've given to us back to you. In your name we pray for your honor and glory.